Okay, so my ND lab was static friction between rubber and wood as a function of temperature, not time. Uh, I don't know why I made that mistake. Anyway, the purpose was to determine if increasing temperature has any effect on the coefficient of static friction between wood and rubber. And my hypothesis was that increasing temperature will result in higher coefficients of friction. It's a pretty simple lab, admittedly, but I, it was pretty, uh, I did have to do a lot of data collection. So the equipment I used was a force sensor, a freezer, uh, a bathtub with functional water heating, really any way to heat something up, a rubber track, which I used uh, something like this, the rubber things that go on the bottom of the walls, um, and a lot of dimensions. It's basically just this. It's There's no specific reason it's this, those dimensions, because this is just a wood block I found in my garage. It's, uh, it has a nail sticking out of it, which is just for the force sensor to connect to. Um, you also need a towel, a temperature measurement device. I used a temperature laser. I'm not sure the name of the brand, but it's you just point it, and then it tells you the temperature. It's pretty useful. It'd be a lot better than using a thermometer. And then necessary data analysis, soft or hardware, so water pro. The experimental setup, I forgot to take a picture, so you get this. It's basically just the wood block on the rubber track, and you pull it with the one kilogram mass on it with the force sensor, and you record the data. And the data looks something like this. It's a standard um, static friction graph. There's a high point, which is the maximum force of static friction, and then the lower points, which are kinetic friction. And the points measured was the numerical value for force of static friction. So the procedure was, um, for room temperature, it was the most simple. It was you just do what I said before. You just move it a little bit and then determine what the force of static friction is. And you do it roughly 30 times. I did it, I did it something like 35 times, although there's only uh, 25 that I graphed because there's a lot of outliers in a lab like this. So, and then for low temperature tests, it's you just put it in the freezer to get it really cold. And then afterwards you towel it off to get rid of any frost. It's not a major source of error, but it would be a problem if I had to total up the frost. And then the same thing for hot. Uh, uh, you fill a bathtub with really hot water, and then take it out, towel it off, and then measure the temperature. And to keep temperature, you obviously can't keep temperature constant, but you can measure the initial temperature and the final temperature between the experiment, and you average them out, and that's the value for the temperature in the graph. So derivations are pretty simple. Uh, it's in vertical equilibrium, so the normal force is mass times 9.81, and then there's just standard equations that everybody knows. So uh, maximum static friction is equal to the coefficient of static friction times normal force, and then just simple algebra gives you coefficient of static friction equals maximum static friction divided by normal force. And so raw data it's pretty simple. I had to do a lot of data collections. This took something like five or six days because I had to redo it a bunch of times. And I, you know, changed some small thing about it. Like my earlier runs, I only had like four, four different data points, which was, it didn't really work because so many of them are off. As you can see, the first one on each one, and this is very consistent, is higher than the rest. And I'm not really quite sure why that happened, but that's one of the reasons why I had to do so many. It's just because there's so much room for uh, personal cause there. And here's the data table. Um, there's pretty simple calculations all throughout it, but the conclusion I came to was that for cold, the coefficient of static friction was 0.79. For room temperature, it's 0.76. And when it's hot, it's 0.66 meaning it goes down as temperature goes up, which is the exact opposite of what I expected. This is not a good fit for the graph. Um, it's inverse exponential, which doesn't really make any sense. I tried to linearize it, but it didn't really work, um, primarily because of the room temperature point. It would, like, I, if I used like a log graph to linearize it, this point would be, it would be like a line, and then this point would be like above the line. So if I were to redo this lab, I would try to get better data for that point. Anyway, so the conclusion, oh, yeah, um, so, 
Um, the source of error were uh, temperature change during experimentation. While the averaging did somewhat help this, it was um, it was still a problem because you aren't getting the exact temperature at each different test. Um, inconsistent force applied, which is what I was talking about earlier, you apply a different force each time. It's a pretty common problem in force based tests. And leftover liquid or frost after toweling. Um, yeah, pretty self explanatory. And um, towel lowering temperature, which wouldn't really, now that I think of it, isn't much of an issue because you measure the temperature after you towel off the liquid. So, um, so the conclusion between rubber and wood, the coefficient of static friction goes down with temperature. I'm, I'm going to go back on what I said about inverse exponentially. Um, and this raises a lot of questions like if it gets really cold, then the coefficient of static friction would probably be above one, which would mean it's really sticky, which I don't know why it would be sticky if it's cold. So I think it would probably max out somewhere at 0.9, which would be, I'm, I'm not going to guess what temperature that would just be, that wouldn't be scientific. Um, and if, if it's really hot, the coefficient of static friction obviously couldn't get to zero because no friction has is impossible. And experiments that could answer these questions are pretty impractical, but somewhat interesting. But they're impractical because doing experiments at such, like you know, below zero or uh, greater than 100 Celsius are both impractical. Although they could be done with robots. So thank you. Thank you. Time for a question. So you said you had like 35 data points collected for each one, but you uh, discluded some of those. Does that um, like mess with your data, or did it not? It improved the data. Oh, I also forgot to mention that um, the reason I couldn't do error calculations is because this um, this has never been done before between wood and rubber, at least. So, as I said, these are outliers. They would obviously raise the average pretty significantly. And there's others that I didn't use, the ones that, let's, let me find an example. Um, this one right here. This one doesn't really um, peak the same way the others do, where it's like a high point and then it goes lower. This sort of has low point, high point, and then an even lower point. So I would exclude ones like that that don't really seem to be accurate to static friction which would make it more accurate. Colby? So is each one of those like blocks one run on its own? Yeah, each different spike is one test. Okay. Dr. Schuster? I am really intrigued by those three starts. Yeah, I don't know why that happened. Um, I honestly can't tell you why. Maybe I think, it's be I think it might be because I like, I just don't know. It just seemed like there was more static friction in the first test. So you made a break of what seems to be like three or four seconds in between each sequence of runs. Is something happening between the two substances that's locking them in tighter if you give them a slightly longer break? Now, I mean, that could be another independent lab where you're studying the different time periods of breaking. Maybe they're nestling in with one another during that few yeah. seconds. That's an interesting idea. Actually, on the bottom, you can see, you might not be able to see on the video, but there's, because um, I did so many tests with this one block, there's a lot of like residue from the rubber on the bottom of the block. So that might have something to do with it. I don't know. But that might be it. Any other questions?